And now we take you to Evangel Assembly of God in Tallahassee, Florida, to another powerful, life-changing message. For more information, visit our website, evangelag.org. Kathy and I enjoyed it. A great vacation in North Carolina, and I intended to begin a series of messages today called Faith for Tough Times, but while we were away, we just noticed that the devil is causing a lot of havoc here in America. The devil has been causing a lot of havoc around the world on Friday. Uh, Mary and, and Bill, Derenberger, just wave, guys. You know, they've got kids that live in Istanbul, and they've got a number of grandchildren over there. And then we have another missionary, Bethany Moore, who's from our congregation, who's also living in Istanbul. And, you know, the military tried to f- create a coup and I, I think it's been, it's the, the, the government is back in, in, intact, but it, they shut down the airport. It's been very, 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 very confusing as to what's going on. And we just need to pray for protection for, for Sandy and Cheftat Isdemur and all of their children. We need to pray protection for Bethany Moore. I understand her mom's over there and they are out of the country right now. I think they're in Bulgaria or someplace, but Tanya Krastanova is over in Bulgaria right now. We just need to pray protection and blessing for them. And then we, we need to be praying for France as a nation. You saw on Thursday night where, where an Islamic extremist terrorist rented a 20-ton truck and he drove it for a mile and a half through great crowds of people, killing 84 people, 10 of them being children. And it, it just it doesn't make any sense. And then last week we had the shooting deaths of two black men by by police officers in Minnesota and in Louisiana. And then we saw five police officers in Dallas ambushed by a sniper and killed. Seven other police officers were injured. And, 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 and there's probably been a whole lot more than just those things going on. And, you know, I, I looked it up. Did you know that so far this year in 2016... We've had over 26 police officers to be killed in the line of duty. Last year, in 2015, up to the first six months of the year, there was 18 police officers killed. Here's what I'm saying, folks. We, we, if, if we don't put a value, the Bible says in Psalms that if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And we cannot allow the foundation of respect for law enforcement to be destroyed in this nation. And I realize every, every, every officer may not have the right attitude, may not do what they're supposed to do, but we do have systems in place for dealing with those things. And, and so you don't want anarchy in this country. We don't want, there's anarchy. I'm telling you, there are places in this world I've gone to and there is anarchy. I, I've had to go to places where I've had, I've had bodyguards and I've, I've had, I've had guards, I had one, I was in one place, I had a, in a third world nation, I had a guard with a submachine gun and he, he just, he had to stay awake all night long and I kept thinking, Jesus may not fall asleep. He was guarding us. I've been, to, I've been to many places where there is absolute anarchy. I've been to many places where they've got huge walls around stores and around, around factories and they've got, they've got Constantino wire and Bob wire up just to keep the criminal element out. They've got watchtowers and they've got, they got men with, it looks like a prison, but it's a place of commerce and it's because there's anarchy. You don't want that. And so we've got to, we've got to show respect to whom respect is due, folks. You know, I, 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 I'm going to talk to you today about the racial divide in America. Not because I want to, but because I felt like I need to. You know, I, I was, I was raised in the 1960s. I graduated from high school in 1972. Some of you, are older than me, and many of you are younger than me. So many of you are thinking, man, he's ancient. But let me tell you, the decade of the 1960s was a day of civil rights activism. It was an entire decade. The, the civil rights bill had been passed in 1964. In 1968, Dr. Martin Luther King, who espoused peaceful, not violence, but peaceful change, he was gunned down in Memphis, Tennessee, 
He was standing on the balcony of a, of a motel, and he was gunned down. He was assassinated. And I remember going to Rickards High School. Back then, Rickards was a junior high and a senior high. It was grades 7 through 12. And I was in the 8th or ninth grade. I can't remember. But I, I remember going to a homeroom that morning and talking to some of my black friends. And some of them were crying. They were upset. They said, we are angry and we are mad. We can't believe this has happened. Here was a man who was standing for peace, and now somebody's killed him. And my very first class was chorus, and the choral room at Rickards High School was in the back of the school. And so I had that first period class, and I came out of that first period class going to my second period class, and I, I heard all this noise, and I looked to my right, and there were black and white kids that were frightening to my in front of the band room and I looked ahead of me at the gymnasium and there were black and white kids that were fighting and I looked up towards a wood shop which my class was at and and there were kids that were fighting up there and I thought I don't think I want to stay around here so me and two or three other guys we took out the back of the school and we ran across athletic fields hopped the fence made our way through the woods over to Paul Russell Road and it took me a couple of hours but I ended up finding my way home and I don't think I went back to school for a couple of days because things Things, things were not pleasant. And that was a long time ago. Some of you lived through those days. And for some of you, it's just history. And I get concerned. I want you to hear my pastor's heart. I get concerned for several generations of white kids and black kids and white adults and black adults and Hispanic adults and Asian adults and everybody. I get concerned because there's a whole lot of people, they just know the name Dr. Martin Luther King, that we've got roads named after him today, and he was an historical figure, and that they know that some people suffered for, for things a long time ago, but all they know, all they know is that life is hard, and life's not fair, and some feel trapped economically, they feel trapped because they, they don't know what to do, and they're frustrated. Folks, let me just talk to you. Is this okay? Can I just talk to you? Let's talk about, let's look at Acts. T turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 10. And let's ask ourselves, how did the first century church deal with racial problems? How did the first century church deal with issues like this. And I would just tell you, it was the Holy Spirit had a plan. And I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit's got a plan today. I said, the Holy Spirit's got a plan today. Let's start reading at verse 9 of Acts chapter 10. This is out of the New Living Translation. The next day, as Cornelius' messengers were nearing the town, Peter went up on the flat roof to pray. It was about noon, and he was hungry, and while a meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance, and he saw the sky open, and something like a large sheet was let down by his four corners. In the sheet were all sorts of animals and reptiles and birds, and a voice came and said to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat, and no, Lord, Peter declared, I've never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure and unclean. But the voice spoke again, do not call anything unclean if God has made it clean. The same vision was repeated three times. Then the sheet was suddenly pulled up to heaven. And Peter was very perplexed. He says, what could this vision mean? Just then the man, the man sent by Cornelius found Simon's house and standing outside the gate. Now that's, you need to understand that standing, they stood outside the gate out of respect because they were Gentiles and they weren't supposed to come inside that gate. Standing outside the gate, they asked if a man named Simon Peter was staying there. Meanwhile, as Peter was puzzling over the vision, the Holy Spirit said to him, Three men have come looking for you. Get up, go downstairs, and go with them without hesitation. Don't worry, for I have sent them. So Peter went down and says, I'm the man you're looking for. Why have you come? And they said, We've been sent by Cornelius, a Roman officer. He's a devout and God-fearing man, well-respected by all the Jews. A holy angel instructed him to summon you to his house so that you can hear your so he can hear your message. And so Peter invited the men to stay for the night. 
And the next day he went with them, accompanied by some of the brothers from Joppa. And they arrived in Caesarea the following day. And Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. And as Peter entered his home, Cornelius fell at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter pulled him up and said, stand up. I'm a human being just like you. So they talked together and they went inside where many others were assembled. And Peter told them, you know, it's against our laws for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this or to associate with you. Now, read this last sentence with me aloud. Come on, use your best voices. But God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. Come on, say that sentence again with me. But God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. Peter's basically admitting, he says, hey guys, I've had prejudice, I've had bias in my heart toward you Gentiles, but God has has shown me that I, I should no longer think of you as impure or unclean. He says, I was raised to think that I wasn't supposed to ever go to your house and you were never supposed to come to my house, but your man came to my house and now I'm here in your house. Everybody listen to this. The only hope for America is Jesus Christ and him crucified, dead, buried, risen the third day, resurrected from the grave, sending the powerful Holy Spirit, him the word becoming flesh. The only hope for black America is Jesus and him crucified. The only hope for white America is Jesus Christ and him crucified. The only hope for Hispanic America, for Asian America, the only hope for Turkey, the only hope for Europe, the only hope for for the world is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I looked at the Bible last couple of days and I asked myself, how many different people groups were in that first century church? How many, how many differences did they really have and how did they deal with them. We know that we know that there were Jewish believers from Palestine. That means they were from Jerusalem and from Israel. They were in the church. And we also know there were Jewish believers from other parts of the world. These the, the, these people were Jews who had come to believe in Christ as Messiah, but they didn't have the same customs and they didn't look like those Jews that were from Palestine. They 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 spoke differently and they acted differently and they had so many differences that just go back and read Acts chapter six. It's all about resolving the differences between the Palestinian Jews and the Grecian or the Hellenistic. Jews, but also there were Gentiles who, who were getting saved. There were these non-Jewish people that the Jews called the uncircumcised. They, 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 they dealt with them as they, they said they're pagan. They're riffraff. And when those Gentiles started getting saved, man, those Jewish Christians didn't know what to do because here they are, the uncircumcised. And you go back and read Acts chapter 15. That's what that's all about. What are we going to do? How are we going to deal with this issue? Because we got Paul and Silas and Paul and Barnabas are out there evangelizing these Gentiles. And we got a strong church at Pisidia and Antioch. And what are we going to do with this thing? And there's a fourth group of people in that first century church. And that was African believers. There were dark skinned believers. There was a Simon of Cyrene who carried the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And there's the Ethiopian eunuch that gets saved. Philip ministered to him coming out of Samaria. Not only that, but then there were slaves of all backgrounds and all colors. You say, pastor, where do you read about that? Go read the book of Philemon. You'll read a, you know, of, 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 a sca- of a slave named Onesimus. And Paul calls Onesimus my son. He, didn't, he called Timothy my son in the faith. He calls Onesimus my son. And then, you know, also in the church there were slave owners. That's hard to fathom, isn't it? But there was a man named Philemon. And he had a church that his, his house was so big, they all met together in his house and then there was another group of people in the church called the freedmen in Acts 6 we read about the synagogue of the freedmen they were slaves who somehow 
had bought their freedom. So they're in the first century church. And then there are Romans. I mean, all the Jews hated the Romans because they were the occupiers. There are Romans getting saved. What you going to do with that? We're all together. We're in all in one melting pot. And last but not least, there were Samaritans in the church. Folks, the Jews hated the Samaritans because they were considered to be half-breeds. They, were, they, were, they started off as Assyrian people that had been sent back to repopulate the, 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 the promised land when, when, when the, the Jews had been taken to Babylon and to Assyria. So the king... I'm moving around and getting, I, I'm probably doing that. I apologize. Our sound people do a great job and there, there's, there's something going on, but I'll try to get, I'll tell you what, I'll try to be still, okay? <laughs> Pray for him. Say, Jesus, help him. The Samaritans were hated by the Jews because they were, the Samaritan race, they came from, they were half Assyrian and half Jewish and they didn't worship the way the Jews wanted them to worship. And it was scandalous when Jesus sat and talked to the woman by the well and asked her for some water. And the disciples were saying, why are you talking to her? Because she was a Samaritan woman. And Jesus not only gets water from her, he tells her where she can get some living water. She gets born again. She goes back to her city. She tells everybody, come meet a man who's told me everything I've done. He knew that, that, that I've been married four times and the guy I'm living with now I'm not married to. Come meet a man. They go and check Jesus out. They get saved. There's revival and the disciples are mad. Don't, 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 don't forget that it was James and John that wanted to call down fire on a Samaritan village. Come on, they, and James and John are pretty important. I mean, they're pretty important disciples, right? But they had bias in their heart. They had some prejudice, they had some things that they, they're having to work through. And in Luke chapter 10, Jesus tells a parable. They love Jesus' stories. But in this parable, Jesus makes the hero a Samaritan. In fact, we know it as, I'm not staying still, am I? We know it as the good Samaritan. I believe that when Jesus made the Samaritan the hero of that story, that you could hear a pin drop. How dare, how dare Jesus suggest that there could be a good Samaritan? Just before Jesus ascended back to the right hand of the Father to send the Holy Spirit. He said these words, and as a Pentecostal church, these are important words to us. He says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be witnesses unto Jerusalem. And everybody said, amen, right on. To Jerusalem, to Judea. Well, yeah, that's that's Israel. We can do that. Amen. And then he says, and to Samaria. And they got quiet. (laughs) And then he said, to the uttermost parts of the earth. Folks, embedded in the DNA of the gospel of Jesus Christ, embedded in the DNA of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, embedded in the Holy Ghost, embedded in the Word of God. This is a cross-cultural gospel. Verse 29, let's look at that. Peter says, so I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. Now tell me why you sent for me. And Cornelius replied four days ago, I was praying in my house about this same time, three o'clock in the afternoon. And suddenly a man in dazzling clothes was standing in front of me. And he told me, he says, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard. And your gifts to the poor have been noticed by God. Look look at verse 31. Read it with me aloud. Come on. He told me, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your gifts to the poor have been noticed by God. Folks, don't ever think that your prayers are inconsequential. 
Don't ever fall into that lie from the devil that it doesn't do any good to pray. And don't ever accept that lie from the enemy that it doesn't do any good to, to worship God with your tithes and with your offerings and with your missions, faith, promises, because there's a God who sees in secret and he rewards us openly. The old devil will come to you and say, it doesn't do any good to give. It doesn't. Let me tell you something. Jesus said, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure. Pressed down. Shaken together. Running over. Shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that you give, it shall be given. Not it may. Not it might. Not sometimes. It shall be given to you. And God will bless you financially. And he'll bless you in ways that money can't buy. You know, you know, last month, I knew somebody that attends our church, and I knew they needed a pair of shoes. And so I went to the shoe store, and I bought them a pair of shoes. I bought them one like I'd like to wear, okay? Bought a nice pair of shoes for them. And I took it to them. Kind of forgot about it. And just before Kathy and I went out of town, I was in Dillard's. And I, I found myself by the shoe department. I was just looking. And I found some really nice, not one, but two pairs of shoes that were really nice. And they were half price. And the salesman came over and he said, sir, he said, not only are these half price, but today you can take an additional 30% off. Do you know I bought not one, but two nice pair of shoes. And I paid about 20% on the dollar what they were actually retail. So somebody say hallelujah. Say, say God... He doesn't pay up every Saturday night. He's not going to settle every Saturday night. But David said, I've been young and I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken or seed begging bread. He'll bless you in ways you hadn't even dreamed about. Amen. Glory to God. He says, now send messengers to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He's staying in the home of Simon a Tanner who lives near the seashore. Verse 33, so I sent for you at once, and it was good for you to come. Now we're all here waiting before God to hear the message the Lord has given you. Verse 34, then Peter replied, I see very clearly that, say these four words with me, God shows no favoritism. Come on, say it again. God shows no favoritism. Folks, we serve a God who is an equal opportunity. God, the world will discriminate against people because of the color of their skin or because of who their mom and daddy were or because of their national or ethnic origin. God is an equal opportunity. God, Peter says here, I see that God shows no favoritism. Okay, but you and I live in a world that people do show favoritism, right? What do you do with it? How do you handle that? Number one, you need to be speaking with your own mouth. The favor of God is in my life. The favor of God is upon me. Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. I am walking in the favor of God. That may not mean that everybody smiles at you that sees you. But I'm walking in the favor, the favor of God. Any, anybody ever been involved in a road rage incident? Been driving down the interstate and down the road and somebody gets really, really mad? Or, how many of you have been the person getting mad? No, don't, don't, don't tell me that. <laughs> Kathy and I were driving home the other day. And we had gotten off the interstate because of, of, of accidents and we we're taking some back roads and we had a fellow that just, I mean, I don't, I don't know who, who, who hurt him. I don't know who upset him, but he got, he was just, I mean, he was just waving his middle finger at us and just shouting and passing us and putting on brakes, trying to make us slow down. And you know, if you're not careful, you can, that old spirit will get in you. If you're not careful, that old, you'll want to, you know, you'll say, who in the world does he think he is? <laughs> we didn't do that. Thank God. Kathy says she wants, she was driving. 
And mama ain't happy. Ain't nobody happy, right? She was driving. And I just closed my eyes. I said, Jesus, I thank you because the favor of God is on us. I thank you. And I didn't even say this to Kathy. Kathy said, you know, I think I'm just going to slow down and let that clown get as far away from me as he can. And that's what we did. We, didn't, we never saw him again. But the favor of God. See, see, see you, 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 we live in a world where people will do wrong things towards you. What you got to know is that greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. What you got to know is that you've got the power to raise Christ from the dead inside you. And what you really got to know is it's really not about you and me. It's about Jesus inside us. Folks, when I preach, it ain't about me. Ain't's not the right word. It's not about me. It's not about what I think is good to preach. It's about what does the Holy Ghost say? Paul says it seemed good to us and the Holy Ghost. You need to be consulting with the Holy Spirit. You've got an opinion here, Lord. What do you want done? Glory to God. you got the favor of God on you. And God's not going to discriminate. In fact, God, the Bible says that promotion doesn't come from the east. It doesn't come from the West. It doesn't come from the South. In other words, real promotion doesn't come from people. I don't know how many of you have ever been rejected for a job and you thought, well, they just, they didn't like the color of my skin or I was rejected because of, of I didn't, I, I, you, know, you know, we're interviewing right now for worship pastors and a children's pastor. And I got an email last night from a fellow that had interviewed with us and we had told him we didn't think it was going to work out. And, and he, 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 Email me. Well, did I say something wrong? Did I do something? And I said, brother, you didn't do anything wrong. Maybe you just don't feel like you're the right fit for our congregation. You're a great man. God's got great plans of you for you. Be confident. Go forward in faith. Folks, don't, 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 don't buy into this thing. Zach used this last week. I'm going to be still. We do have a new one. I just haven't had time to, to, to figure out altogether how to work it. But Brother Mike up there has been trying to meet with me. And so we're going we're gonna to get that worked out. Our God doesn't discriminate about against us. But people will. And you've got to be aware of that. And, 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 and here's the deal. Everybody, everybody I know wants three or four things. Everybody wants and needs love, acceptance, forgiveness, and respect. Woo, I'll preach it over here. I'm, I'm not being still, am I? I gotta <laughs> nail my boots to this location. Everybody wants love, acceptance, forgiveness, and respect. That means everybody in this congregation, everybody in our neighborhoods, Everybody on the police force, come on, everybody in elected offices, everybody in unelected offices, come on, everybody needs those things. And I, I began thinking this week about the way Kathy and I raised our three children. Thank God that all three girls are married now. And I'm happy to announce, if you haven't seen it on Facebook, that our baby daughter, Kristen, is going to have a baby in December. Glory to God. We've known it for a couple of months, but she told us, don't you dare tell anybody. So I'm glad to announce. I saw that she had announced it, so I thought I can too. Amen. <laughs> but I was thinking about how when we raised our girls and teaching girls to drive, and only a father of girls could understand this because it's not the easiest thing to do. But we taught our, <laughs> we taught our girls to drive and we said, girls, if you ever get pulled over by a police officer, I want you to find a, don't just stop in the middle of a busy road, get off that busy road, find a, a, a place that, 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 that there's not a lot of flow of traffic and stop there. And if it's nighttime and they're stopping you and you're in a desolate area, if you're in an area that's not lit up, you drive and drive slowly now, but drive slowly until you come to a well-lit area. And we said, if a police officer 
if he treats you wrong, if he's got an attitude, if he's doing something he shouldn't do, then, you know, you can report law enforcement officers and it will go in their permanent file. And so I, I, I was thinking about that and I contacted, we have a missionary that we support here, Mike and Eve Brooks, and they're an African-American family. Can we put their photo on the screen. This is Mike and Eve Brooks. They're now in Indonesia. They're, they're with the Assemblies of God, and they're also, I've known these guys for over 25 years. Mike was a, was a pilot in the Air Force, and when he got out of the Air Force, he had all the major airlines were trying to get him to come to work for them because he would take care of their, their minority hiring quotas. He would help towards that, and they were offering him hundreds of thousands of dollars, and he says, no, God has called me to be a missionary. And they've been life career missionaries with the Assemblies of God and also with Wycliffe Bible Translators and with Mission Aviation Fellowship, which is part of Wycliffe. And, and so I contacted Mike by email, and I said, Mike, I, I, what was it like? Because they've got, they've got five children, three boys. And I said, what was it like? raising your kids and what did you tell your kids to do and and, and and here's what mike and eve wrote me back and they're now in indonesia but they said we taught our children to obey authority including police officers if they were pulled over in fact we taught our sons to be extra careful to be polite and compliant to policemen we taught them to follow instructions If they were told to put their hands up and to especially not to say anything that would make or incite a police officer to become angry. Our sons had been pulled over by by police and they were very respectful when they were pulled over with no problems. In fact, one of our sons had to go to court when he was pulled over for speeding while going through our little town of of, of Waxhaw, North Carolina. That's just south of Charlotte. That's where, where Mission Aviation Fellowship is headquartered. Anyway, he says he was pulled over there missing a sign that changed the speed limit to 25 miles an hour. When our son went to court for the speeding violation, we instructed him how he should dress and act. Also, we went with him and waited at the court. Our son was neatly dressed and took responsibility for his actions and spoke very nicely. In the end, the ticket was waived and he didn't have to pay for the violation. On a different note, we instructed our sons not to wear hoodies, hooded jackets, off campus when they were students in college for fear that they would go in a store and be suspected of someone coming in to rob the store. Profiling is a reality because some African-American young men have gone on to stores and robbed the stores wearing hoodies. We believe that most police officers are hard workers and committed to their jobs. There are some that are nervous and jittery because police officers have lost their lives trying to settle domestic violence cases or lost their lives because they've been targeted. We realize that policemen constantly put themselves at risk by trying to help the community and knowing if the situation they are entering in life is threatening for them. We pray for law officers in the United States. We pray that our law officers will not lose hope. Amen. Folks, we, we, God's not going to discriminate against us. And, and we don't want Christians, as Christians, we don't want to be discriminating or having bias in our hearts towards one another. But what do you do when the world discriminates for you, against you? tell you what I do I remind myself that God is bigger than any man and that I'm not wrestling against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places look at verse 36 he says this is the message of good news for the people of Israel that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ who is Lord of all. You know what happened throughout Judea beginning in Galilee after John began preaching his message of baptism. And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. Everybody look at me. There's no record in Scripture of Jesus ever walking up to somebody saying, here, I want you to have cancer. Jesus never walked up to anybody and said, here, I want you to be discriminated against. I'm going to lay my hands on you for that. 
He never walked up to anybody and said, I want you to be economically deprived and live your life in poverty. No, he went around doing good, healing all that were sick and oppressed of the devil. The devil will kill and steal and destroy. And folks, go back and read Deuteronomy 28. It was never God's will for his people to walk in poverty. It was never God's will for his people to live an oppressed life or even a sick life. He said, I want you to live a blessed life. And that's what he's all about. Amen. Glory to God. Verse 39, and we apostles are witnesses of all he did throughout Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him to life on the third day. And then God allowed him to appear, not to the general public, but to all whom God has chosen in advance to be his witnesses. We were those who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach everywhere and to testify that Jesus is the one appointed by God be the judge of all the living and the dead. He's the one all the prophets testify about saying that everyone who believes in him will have their sins forgiven through his name. And even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who were listening to the message and the Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed at the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles too for they heard them speaking with other tongues and praising God. I'm telling you The gift of the Holy Spirit is for every believer. The gift of the Holy Spirit is for every person. And the gift of the Holy Ghost and speaking in tongues was proof positive for the Jews that God was in this thing. And he was changing a worldview. And Peter asked, can anyone object to their being baptized now that they have received the Holy Spirit just as we did? So he gave orders for them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And afterward, Cornelius asked him to stay with them for several days. Norm, come on up to the keyboard, if you will. How many of you, how many of you have ever read the book To Kill a Mockingbird? You know, it's a, I remember reading it when I was in the seventh or eighth grade, and it's a book that deals with Southern racism. And there's a lawyer in that book. His name is Atticus Finch. And Atticus Finch is a small town Alabama lawyer. And in this book, here's this white man who's defending a black man in the 1930s that's accused of rape and he's he's defending him because he knows that he's really innocent and it, it shows his children Atticus Finch's children they start getting persecuted at school and getting persecuted because their daddy is defending a black man and his daughter Scout wants to know why her daddy is defending Tom Robinson And Atticus Finch, he says to his daughter, he says, you know, you never, you never really know a man until you crawl in his skin and until you walk around for a little while. And Atticus Finch felt compassion for Tom. There's a part in the story where, where Atticus Finch goes and sits on the front porch and swings with Tom and his children and his wife and There are people that are driving down the road who are throwing bottles and making racial slurs. And he sees the hurt and the pain in Tom's face. I want everybody to see me. Everybody look at me right now. I'm going to stand still. Everybody look at me. There is not a single person in this room that hadn't been hurt by a person of a different color. There's not a single person watching on television or listening to this podcast that you haven't had somebody to do you wrong. And every one of us, we can say, I'm going to sing a somebody done me wrong song and I'm going to have resentment in my heart or I'm going to forgive even as God in Christ forgave me and I'm going to trust the Lord to work in my life. The Bible in the New Testament says that Jesus became flesh. God's Son became flesh. God's Son crawled into 
human skin. And he walked around so he could understand what you're going through. What I'm going through. So he could see and know. And the writer of Hebrews says he's touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He's touched with the feelings of our infirmities. The Bible says no temptation has overtaken you except that which is common to man. In other words, you're going to be tempted to get mad at people. You're going to be tempted to just be angry and let anger rule the day. But no temptation has overtaken you and me except that which is common to man. But God is faithful because with every temptation, he makes a way of escape. Folks, if there's ever a time in the United States of America that we need to find a way of escape. If ever there was a time that this world needs to run to the cross of Christ, needs to run to the shed blood of Christ, it's today. I want everybody to stand. We pray right now that God uses this message to plant good eternal seeds deep into your soul. For more information, visit our website, evangelag.org. Evangel's all about making the name of Jesus famous and His church glorious. We love God, love people, and love life. And we're here for you, working to help draw people from impossible situations into a loving and friendly circle of hope where answers are found and acceptance is given. We invite you to join us for any of our services, Sunday mornings at 1030 and Wednesday evenings at 7. We're located at 2300 Old Bainbridge Road in Tallahassee. We have fantastic programs for kids and youth and small groups to make deeper connections. And we pray that God blesses you richly and abundantly as you continue to seek Him first in all of your life.